Thursday. <laughs> so this is a short general introduction. Uh, welcome everybody who joined. Um, yeah, we're um, this is the first lecture in our ayahuasca month uh, from UPDA, the MSTEM Psychedelic Research Association uh, voluntary uh, student-based organization uh, based in Amsterdam, uh, focusing on research, uh, mainly psychedelic substances and scientific research in this uh, in this field. Um, and this is, uh, as I mentioned, the first lecture in our Ayahuasca Month series. So at the start of the academic year, actually, um, me and Paloma and Marco and some other members of the team have been working hard to uh, uh, get in contact with some international speakers uh, on the field of uh, Ayahuasca. Um, and we also really try to get some interdisciplinary perspectives um, on this wonderful and very interesting, uh, well, medicine or substance or psychedelic compound. Or, yeah, um, uh, it's wonderful. Yeah. Um, this is your first lecture. We have uh, Luisa Bordeluna um, with us. Um, maybe as a short introduction, I uh, were originally from Florencia in Colombia, <laughs> if I'm correct. Um, conducted um, ethnological research in indigenous population in Peru and Colombia. I uh, various academic degrees um, and experience, experience throughout Europe and the Americas, an author and co-author of several publications, um, topics such as shamanism and indigenous populations from Peru. Um, yeah, I was curated art exhibitions uh, and also um, directed several films on the topic. Um, yeah, so a long line uh, of interesting research. And we're very interested to hear your talk today. Um, epistemological consideration. I love that. Um, so without further ado, I would like to give the floor to you, Luis. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you very much for the invitation. Well, okay. Um, I am going to start with a little bit of bio uh, biographical stuff. As you said, I was born in Florencia, Caquetá, in the Colombian Amazon. It was the Amazon, not any longer. Uh, when I was born, it was, there was no electricity or run water. This is probably when I was about 10 years old or less. And, uh, but I said that it was the Amazon because there is no Amazon any longer there. It is completely deforestated. It is one of the worst places in the world, in fact, uh, uh, due to deforestation, mostly cattle, uh, which was introduced um, uh, <clears throat> probably by the 50s. Um, this is the, the emblem of, of Florencia. It was, uh, can you imagine more alienation? Yeah? Uh, it's uh, the Amazon uh, uh, region, but you have um, uh, access and uh, symbolizing the cutting of the forest, which was very good. And then laurel leaves, which has nothing to do with it, with also uh, a Caribbean palm and uh, indicus, indicus, you know, from India. Uh, that was changed later later and uh, into Heliconias and some uh, Macaus and, and they changed the, <clears throat> the Bos Indica to Bos Taurus. But anyway, it continues to be a completely uh, an area where um, cattle is the most important income. Uh, I was uh, then uh, uh, went to a seminar in Bogota when I was 12 years old. I spent some years there. I was going to be a priest uh, on, and then I was sent to Spain and I spent uh, two and a half years in two monasteries in northern Spain. Then I left the monastery and then went to uh, study in the Complutense de Madrid. That was my first title brought from the Complutense where I studied philosophy and letters. Uh, I, I, I met a lot of writers. I was living in the home of Mira de la Rosa who was from Barranquilla. Uh, she was one of the three great uh, poets, poets uh, Gabriela Mistral, who uh, from Chile, who got the Nobel Prize, and Juana de Barburo from Uruguay. They were the three greatest uh, female poets of the time. But um, in 1971, my life changed by meeting this man, Terence McKenna. I was having holidays in, in Colombia after seven years away. And um, he told me about Yahé, and we got some Yahé through a German guy and a Hungarian guy 
So this was already the beginning of the globalization of ayahuasca. Uh, and uh, in this house uh, in, in near Colombia, 12 kilometers, uh, we, I spent two and a half months with uh, Terence McKenna. He was then writing The Visible Landscape, this uh, book that he published together with his brother, Dennis. And the ayahuasca, we took it, we took was from, uh, made by Apolinaria Canamijoy, who was living in Yurayaco, some kilometers, uh, 60 kilometers from Florencia. Uh, he used to go, I, I knew since I was a child, he used to go to a pension in, in Florencia. Uh, from time to time, I went, uh, kept going there to, to see if I was able to see him. The first time I took Yahe, it was just Terence uh, and uh, this Hungarian and me. Uh, and then uh, finally I saw him and I told him I'm interested to learn more about Yahe. He told me, if you're interested, you have to come back. You have to live with me. You have to be take Yahe 40 nights. And then at the end, Yahe will come. He's a, 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 he's a, a, a muy simpatico. Um, but I didn't have the time. I have to go back to Europe. And then I went to Norway. And in 1973, I went to Berkeley to see Terence McKenna. Uh, it was still the afterglow of, of, the, uh, of the counterculture and, and the very interesting books came out uh, that year or the, just before Hallucinogens and Shamanism by Michael Harner, Flesh of the Gods by Peter Forst and many other interesting books. Uh, and I got this Amazonian Cosmos by Gerardo Reichel Dolmatov uh, who caused me a great impression. I wrote to Reichel Dolmatov incredibly he wrote me back and he advised me to study science. He said, don't study now anthropology, you will get lost, you know, uh, better study something <laughs> very solid, which I did for some years in Oslo. Uh, at that time also this book came out, Wizard of the Upper Amazon, uh, about the life of Manuel Cordova Rios, uh, written by um, uh, Bruce Lamb, who was a forester in Peru. And uh, this was a book that, quite a quite a, an impact not as much as Carlos Castaneda and teachers of Don Juan and all that which he was in, in in the ball in 1979 I went back to Colombia again after another seven years and uh, I, 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 by the way I I <clears throat> I wanted, well, I spent some time with, with uh, uh, two days, in fact, with Apolinar, took Yahé with him, the first time I did it with a shaman. And um, I realized that I have uh, spent years and years of my life studying European history, European philosophy, and I knew anything, I didn't know anything at all about um, the indigenous people you know, of my own country and, and my own province. So it, for me, it was the discovery of uh, uh, Amazonian epistemology. Um, one of the things that I ask him is, why do you take a, a Yahé, Don Apolinar? And he said, to see all those animals out there. That was his answer. Well, by the way, I want to uh, tell you that Yahé is almost uh, uh, like ayahuasca, but there is a different admixture plant. Yahé is with Diplopterus cabrerana, which is called Chiliponga or Chilipanga in that area. And nowadays the Ingano call it Ambihuasca. Ambi is in Quechua is poison. But, um, and, um, and by the way, I, I, I uh, took a lot of photos uh, uh, with Apolinar. And many years later, I met his niece. Um, Waira Yakanamehoi, who is now a fantastic, a very interesting um, um, leader, indigenous leader. Somebody's calling me, but I'm not going to take it. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, and so I have contact with this family again. Oh, God. Uh, Adriana, por favor. Pega el teléfono, oh, just a moment, I have to take this, uh, this, okay, all right, okay. Okay, the difference between Yahé and Ayahuasca is the admixture plan. Yahé is used in some areas of Colombia and Ecuador, while Ayahuasca is used in the rest of Peru, 
Bolivia and uh, all over uh, Brazil. Anyway, uh, I wanted to make a film about Polinar, but he just died before I, uh, I went back to Colombia. Uh, Terence told me, go to Iquitos. There is a very interesting tradition there. He gave me some names. And one of the names, he ne never met them, but one of the names was Don Emilio Andrade Gomez. And I met Don Emilio, made a film, which you can find it on YouTube. If you type uh, Don Emilio and his little doctors in my name, you will see the, the film. It's, it's, I think it's the very first film on ayahuasca. Um, and, uh, and then I discover um, the vegetalista tradition. Um, anthropologists usually go to, went to Iquitos and from Iquitos took a boat and went to see to the different tribes. I stay near Iquitos and I discovered there was this mestizo tradition which was very interesting and uh, linked to the indigenous tradition. Um, they were using uh, Don Emilio and other of his uh, vegetalistas, they were using not only ayahuasca, but many other plants. And uh, um, so this is ayahuasca, uh, Cicotre viridis instead of, of um, Diplopterus cabrerana. And by the way, there is some kind of reductionistic thought about uh, people say, okay, yaje and ayahuasca, they are nearly the same. The same that you have the vine and you have two plants that contain DMT. But in fact, we have to be aware that in, uh, in ayahuasca brew contains many other chemicals. Here we have 124 different chemicals found uh, by a study in the University of Debrecen in Hungary. Don Emilio told me that ayahuasca is just one of the many other plants that are considered doctores. Uh, Toe, Caliandra, uh, Curupita genensis, Brunfelsias, etc. So I dis discovered the concept of plants as teacher. And um, when I asked Don Emilio, why do you take ayahuasca? Uh, his answer was to close the body so that, so that no diseases will penetrate, penetrate the body, cerrar el cuerpo para que no penetren las enfermedades permanecer con las mentes despejadas, to remain with a clear mind, and muy fuerte y pensador para el trabajo, to be strong and willing to work. So it was very practical. It was not so much to see visions. Uh, people go to the, to, the, to, to the Amazon just to see the visions, like it was very important. I, I realized that for, for, for him and for many of these people, the visions, they were in a way uh, secondary. The most important was to strengthen the body and clarify you know, have a, a clear mind to be able to understand nature and to be able to, to, to I mean, in fact, as a tool, as a cognitive tool. I wrote the, this, uh, uh, the concept of plant teachers among four mestizo shamans of Iquitos, which was published first in the Journal of Ethnopharmacology. Then it was in the Zeitschrift for Ethnomedicine on Transcurrere Psychiatry and the La Revista Colombiana de Antropologia, and then in Psychotrop and Journal d'Information sur les drogues et, et leur usage en, en Québec. Y, y escribí mi tesis doctoral que le defendí en el, el Departamento de Religiones Comparadas de Estocolmo. Eh, desgraciadamente no ha sido publicada en español y alguien hizo una traducción, pero al final no, 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 no la publicaron, pero se tradujo y se publicó en una edición muy linda en checo. En fin. Bueno, otro, después de esto, estuve en el Valle de Simundoy. Eh, oh, eh, eh. A professor, yes. You yes. Spanish. You <laughs> Spanish, unconsciously, I think. I, I'm, I was speaking Spanish, I'm oh, sorry. <laughs> so so uh, I spent some time in the Simundoy Valley, a month there, where I was working with Salvador Chindoy, his uh, son, uh, uh, Miguel Chindoy, I was studying the, the garden. The, the, I was interested in the plants of, of used by uh, the Kamsa and the Ingano of, of this area. And uh, um, I sp especially I spent some time with Don Miguel Chindoy and his family. At that time, there was, he had an apprentice. Don Miguel had an apprentice, Jose Francisco Lopez. And he was the one who told me, this is El Jardín de la Ciencia, the science garden. So again, the, the concept of plant as teachers that I found in Iquitos, now I found it in Sibundoiba, the same idea that the plants are teachers, you know? So, so it, it is like sort of, plants are a sort of university. 
uh, the, in the Sibondoi Valley, the most important plant is uh, uh, Metisticodendrum amesianum. It was the, the, the name that was given by Schultes. Now it has been rebaptized by um, Esbrugmanse aurea. It's called the Culebra, a very interesting, extremely potent plant contain uh, uh, atropic, uh, atropinic uh, alkaloids. Uh, but uh, anyway, the Sibondoi Valley is, is known by uh, for the for the Brugmansias. It is the main the main uh, um, group of plants used there. Uh, the yaje they they buy it from people down in the in the, in the Mocoa, and and then they travel in fact in Colombia in Colombia with yaje, but they don't do not um, uh, make 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 it. In 1985, I organized in Bogota the first international symposium, um, um, interdisciplinary symposium uh, on the Banisteriopsis complex. I invited Dennis McKenna, Jean Landon, many other anthropologists. And at the end of that um, the symposium, I went with Dennis McKenna to Pucallpa, and he had met this man who told me he's very interesting man. He seems to know a lot. Dennis spoke not so good Spanish at the time. So I discovered that Pablo and Maringo knew very much about plants. And Excuse then me. he showed Luis Eduardo. Yes. Sorry. Yes. Um, are you are you changing your slides? Yes. You you are we, not seeing them? We're only seeing the first one. My goodness. This is very bad. Oh, I, I, I'm using the slides all the time. Mm -hmm. What is happening here? Are you presenting from two different computers? No, no. I have only one computer. And all this is with slides. I don't understand what is happening here. Oh. OK, yeah, we missed, we missed a lot of. Uh... You, you missed a lot of information. Yeah. Visually, you don't see anything now? No, no yeah, see we're seeing, now we're seeing your slides. Yes. Oh, wow. Maybe, maybe, OK, well. Could you maybe go through the slides that you went through so far, you know, just so that we can see the, the images, because I think. Uh, yes, 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 yes. All right. OK, it's going to be it. very fast then. Yeah, okay. you can do the presentation, so, but just to see what was on this, so we can see what was on the slide. OK, so yes. OK, here you have Florencia, and then and then the, the, the deforestation, the cattle. No, are, the you different, seeing, uh, are you changing? We're still on the. Yes, I'm changing. It's. Uh, I'm not... Se queda, se queda congelado. Entonces, tal vez I si puedes understand. mostrarnos las diapositivas. Ah, sí, yo creo que toca así. Porque cuando le das okay. play, se queda congelado. Okay, uh -huh. okay. Well, I'm sorry. So I have to do it like this. So here are the slides. I'm very sorry, you know, because because uh, I, I I work with with slides mostly, you know. So this is Berkeley. Michael Harner, Peter Forrest, Raisel Dolmatov, the Wizard of the Upper Amazon, Manuel Cordova Rios, this is Don Apolinar and his family. Uh, why do you take uh, Yaje, Don Apolinar? And this is Yaje, which Diplopterus Cabrerana, this is the admixture plant. This is uh, uh, Guaira, uh, who is the niece of Apolinar, who is a fantastic leader today in Colombia, fighting for the land, as many indigenous people. Yaje in ayahuasca, yaje is used in Colombia and Ecuador, ayahuasca in many other areas of Peru, and Peru and, and the Bolivia and Brazil. This is Don Emilio, the film I made with uh, um, uh, Don Emilio Andrade Gomez, this is ayahuasca with Cicotria, and the, the many 124 different uh, uh, chemicals that you find in, 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 in uh, ayahuasca, the different admixture plants, and the, the, the reasons why Don Emilio and all these people take ayahuasca in order to close the body, to remain with a clear mind and to be strong and willing to work. These are the publications. Um, this article that was translated into German and French and published in Spanish, my doctoral thesis. And the Sibundoy Valley, Don Salvador Sindoy, 1986. And this is the Garden of Science. Um, Don Miguel Chindoy and, uh, and, and his apprentice. This is Brugmansia Aurea. Uh, as I said, in the Sibondoy Valley, the most important plant used is, are the Brugmansias. 
the, and now we have Pablo Maringo. And he used to, when I met Pablo, he had the, on cheap paper, he made these uh, landscapes. Um, and I recognize his knowledge of, of not only of the plants, but also the way of living in, in the Amazon. And then he told me that he could remember anything he saw. Then I got the idea. Um, do you remember the, the visions you had when you were taking ayahuasca? He said, I do. Uh, and, and then he, this is the first um, vision he made. And uh, I was thinking of Rachel Dolmatov. Um, Rachel Dolmatov, uh, well, the Amazonian cosmos, he did it with only one informant when he was in Bogota. And then when he went to, to the Barasana and the Sana, he took with him paper and pencils, color pencils, and then tell, told the Indian, do whatever you like. And then he realized that all the iconography of the Desana and Barazana was related to the visionary world. So I had the same idea. Okay, well, let's, uh, uh, I provided Pablo with all the, the best paper and brushes, gouache, everything he needed. And then he started to do the, his visionary work. And here we have the spirit of the, the idea of plant teachers. Of course, he, he is a, he was embedded into in, in this mestizo vegetalista tradition. Um, and for me as an anthropologist, one thing is when you hear uh, somebody telling you a myth or telling you about the spirits, but it's completely different when you can see, when you can see how they interpret, how, how they think of it. And, and so he, uh, I dedicated myself several years sending him uh, the materials. I went to Pucallpa. Uh, he was very poor. He had uh, he lived in, in a very humble house, no electricity, no running water. Uh, but gradually I started to sell prints and then sell the um, paintings to colleagues. So he could dedicate himself completely to painting. And, uh, and then I found this, the, 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 you know, his ideas, every plant, every tree, every plant has a spirit. People may say that the plant has no mind, I tell them a plant is alive and conscious. A plant may not talk, but there is a spirit in it that is conscious, that sees everything, which is the soul of the plant, its essence, what makes it alive. I feel a great sorrow when trees are burned, when the forest is destroyed. I feel sorrow because I know that human beings are doing something very wrong. When one takes ayahuasca, one can see something, sometimes hear how the trees cry when they are going to be cut down. They know beforehand, beforehand, and they cry. So uh, this book, uh, well, uh, we published a book together uh, called Ayahuasca Visions, which was a little revolution for, for some of, of my anthropological colleagues because they took the book to the indigenous people and they immediately recognized Absolutely, there was ayahuasca. There was, there was, you know, perhaps the, the, of course, the figure that can be different, the mythology can be different, but it was instant, instant recognition, not only the indigenous people, but also people in Pucallpa. They, they knew right away, oh, this is, yeah, this is ayahuasca. It's the first time that anybody was doing this kind of work. So this is a painting that I have here behind me, the Amazonian cosmos. It's extraordinary the richness uh, of of the uh, of of what is in the was in the mind of Pablo Maringo, because you could see um, not only Amazonian um, um, figures and the, 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 you can get other people can recognize, but there were also these beings from Africa, from Asia, um, uh, architecture which was at the same time ancient and futuristic, and so on. So there was the, the first time that we, we could see, my goodness, this is what happens when you take ayahuasca. This is what, what opens up. And, and so you can see these Amazonian people, humble, you know, and, and then you realize that this is what is going on in their minds. You know? uh, many of the concepts that later on found in the literature, for instance, uh, this uh, Vivero de Castro, is that when, when the, the, the shaman is able to see this 
beings, these non-human persons, as they see themselves as human. So you re recognize that this is a, a human world with it, you know, even the, the, the animals, when, when they see their world, they see it as human. And uh, uh, so we can see a jaguar, but the jaguar, when see us, a jaguar sees a jaguar, and he himself is human. So this is what the Viveiro de Castro calls uh, perspectivism. And then the, uh, the transformation, which was, is, and I'm going to talk uh, more about that later, which is one of the most possibly pu puzzling uh, things that happened with ayahuasca and, and it's something which you find in, in pre-Columbian iconography is the theme of transformation. What is going on here? So the people are able to transform really themselves into Jaguar, what is this? I'm going to discuss it later. Okay, and then um, here, for instance, in this vision, we see Curpita Ganensis. Here, this is the tree. Uh, uh, this is the uh, shaman traveling within the Seiba Pentandra, one of the greatest, uh, 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 most sacred uh, trees, not only in the Amazon, but also in Mesoamerica, Seiba Pentandra. And this is a tree, this is growing in, in our home in, in Brazil. These are the Renaco ficus, uh, ficus um, which is growing in the lakes. And this is the spirit world, you know, hab habitating uh, those uh, plants. And, and, and then the idea that in order to learn, it is necessary some kind of initiation, which implies the death of to the ordinary conception of the world, which is in, in this case is depicted by the person is being um, uh, uh, triturated uh, 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 with this machine and his blood is collected and drunk by the spirits. So uh, this is one of the, 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 the ways uh, that uh, they think that in order to learn about, about these things, you have to die somehow to your normal conception of the world. And that is what caused the, the greatest fear, because suddenly you realize that it's much more than you think. So this is sometimes called the ego death, which means, in fact, the discovery of other aspects of reality that did not seem possible at all. So this is the book that we published together. And I found the same idea. Uh, Pablo told me that he had learned all this, and he learned to paint uh, through ayahuasca. Ayahuasca told him to mix colors. Uh, he was totally self-taught. He never went to any school, you know, uh, and, and besides he had an incredible uh, eidetic memory. Uh, he could remember very well uh, what he saw and painted it in, in detail. I found uh, Agustin Rivas, he was at the time a sculptor. Um, uh, now he's a, a shaman. Uh, um, and, and he told me exactly the same thing. He was through ayahuasca, he learned how to sculpt. He said that he took it and then he could see in the roots uh, or in the trees, he, he could see what it was behind. He just carved it and make it uh, alive. I spent some time also with the Chipibo. The Chipibo are famous because of the beautiful iconography in the ceramics and the textiles. And uh, perhaps the, the, what, the most important lesson I learned when I was uh, with him, uh, I was in the diet. I, I wanted to, you know, uh, um, as an anthropologist, I wanted to, to go through the process to be able to try to understand what was going on. Uh, I don't know. I think that perhaps at that time, I was the, the first anthropologist to take the brew, go, do, through, go through the diet as, as a method to uh, understand, uh, try to understand what was happening. And the, perhaps the most important lesson that Basilio uh, uh, told me was that I was interested in collective plants. He told me, if you, are in, if you know the song of a plant, you don't need the plant. Because the plant, uh, this is the same idea among the vegetalistas, the plant, the, the song, the Icaro, they call it Icaro, is like the quinta essence of the tree, of the plant. So just with the songs, you are able to cure. And in fact, the whole curing um, ceremonies of the Shibibo is just with song. You don't see the plant. It is just song, They're singing the whole night through. I spent some time doing field work 
uh, in Brazil uh, with the churches, I uh, realized that nobody has ever studied the Barquinha, which is the second, uh, chronologically the second religious organization that take uh, ayahuasca as a sacrament. It was called the Barquinha. The founder was Daniel Pereira de Mato. So I spent uh, several uh, months working with Barquinha, trying to understand what is behind. And for them, very important is the, what they call it, the incorporation of spirits. They take the brew and then they are able, they are within the Afro-Brazilian tradition, they are able to incorporate spirits and these spirits have knowledge and they, um, they help uh, them to understand other people. In fact, when I was there every Wednesday, I think, there was a long queue of people in the church um, consulting the, consulting the, the, the pretos bellos, they call it, the, the old the black slaves, uh, um, because they could, uh, these people can, could incorporate the spirit and they were knowledgeable, not only about plants and so on, but also about human affairs. Um, in, in fact, I, 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 uh, I saw a, a, a case in which there were a couple, they were both incorporated spirits and they consult each other about the marital <laughs> problems so that the, the woman was consulting the, the, his, her husband on there uh, who was incorporating a preto bello and he was telling it, uh, you know, uh, how to deal with the problems they had. So this was in, in the church, the, the, the Barquinha, uh, they do services in the church from eight to, to midnight. And then they, uh, after midnight, they change completely, then you have the Afro-Brazilian uh, with drums and dancing and so on. And uh, uh, I mean, it's another way of, 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 of um, um, using the brew. And perhaps one of the concepts, since we are talking about plants as teacher, ayahuasca as a teacher, um, what they say it is that ayahuasca will teach you the mysteries, the encantos, but it all depends on your merecimiento, your, if you are worthy of not. Uh, 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 so they do not ex expect, uh, uh, the, the, the brew will give them uh, songs and they will give insights and so on. So this is the way they, they learn. Uh, Jean-Pierre Chomel wrote this book, uh, uh, Voir, Savoir, Pouvoir, and he did realize that also for the, for the, um, uh, the um, uh, I don't remember now <laughs> the tribe, uh, uh, for them, uh, um, the plants are Lunique Chemin de la Connaissance, the only path of no the Yagua, uh, the Yagua, Lunique Chemin de la Connaissance, the only path of knowledge. And the same idea, uh, if you read El Bebador de Yagé, this is uh, Fernando Payaguaje, uh, who is um, Sequoia, uh, he complained that not able to continue their Yagé rituals. Today, Sequoia think that they are deprived of knowledge and turned into ordinary people because for the Sequoia, it is the Yahé who is giving them the knowledge, a way to be uh, different. Uh, they have access to other kinds of, of knowledge. And the uh, Yanomame uh, um, David Copanawa, he said that I did not learn to think about the things of the forest by setting my eyes on paper skins of books. I saw them for real by drinking my elders' breath of life with the Yakoana power they gave me. Yakoana is the, uh, the, um, the um, virola snuff. Okay, so why do the indigenous people take them the, uh, ayahuasca and these other plants? One, to see the reality of the mythical world. Uh, the, the, um, Tucano, they give it to the to the yaje, to the adolescents, so that they can see for themselves that the myth, the mythology, the, what they tell it, the elders are telling them, it is true because they are able to see them themselves. It is also used as an instrument to visit a specific realms of their cosmology. For example, about the Siona, the Siona may take three nights in, in the row. The shaman will decide, okay, tonight we are going to the third heaven 
to this, the second river in the third heaven. And they go to these specific places where there are specific songs to go there and the specific spirit and so on. So they help them to navigate within the cosmology. Um, they use the vine as a tool to get in touch with the spirit of other plants. And in fact, for instance, in the Sibundoy Valley, the ayahuasca the yate, is used as the substrate to put other plants uh, as a, a mixture of plants. And then in this way, they get in touch with the spirit of these other plants and the plants will reveal, reveal them what are they for. So this is a tool of knowledge of, to increase the pharmacopoeia or to facilitate the relationship with the natural world, to see animals and other non-human persons as they see themselves as human. And the, the other way is the, the other reason why they take him is their recognition of patterns that relate what for the Western world are unrelated associations. I don't have here the slide, but some people in Central, uh, Central America, in Costa Rica, they associate the Banisteropsis capi with the jaguar because when you cut the vine, you have like the spots on, on the jaguar and you find this in pre-Columbian iconography. This is the well by Rebecca Stone. And of course, diagnosis of illness and help navigation in the dream world. And this is important because I don't think uh, um, people are giving enough um, importance to uh, how ayahuasca and these other plants may trigger a trigger a dreaming. In fact, there are plants, the uh, Curupita guianensis, for example, who are uh, onerogenic. Uh, they are plants that are make you to dream. When I was with Jose Corral keeping the diet, uh, I was having from time to time lucid dreams, you know, dreams in which you realize that you are dreaming and you are awake in your dream. And I was telling Don Jose, he said, and now you see, now you are learning. So this is a, another of the tools uh, to uh, the use uh, ayahuasca for. Okay, now, so a little bit about animism. Animism is then the idea that these plants, many animals, they are all um, intelligent intelligent beings. Um, it was uh, uh, Alfred uh, Irving uh, Hallowell, the first one who um, coined the term non-human persons. And he realized that uh, among the Ohiwa, uh, they, um, they, uh, this idea of, of, of all non-human persons means mutual obligations and are uh, necessary in the interaction with persons throughout the, the world. Relationships are both moral and reciprocal, not only among humans, but between humans and other than human persons. It's a necessary, necessary vital in everyday part of life. So he, he was doing uh, the, his uh, work uh, around the uh, Great Lakes in between Co uh, Canada and the, U the US. Eduardo Cohn, a Brazilian, British, I don't know, uh, anthropologist, he said that selfhood does not solely belong to humans. Any entity which has communicates through the use of signs can be considered a self leading to a complex ecology of selves of human are not and not human are both apart. So uh, animism to a great extent is the recognition that there is mind in life, that there is subjectivity. And uh, um, uh, I'm, I'm, I like very much the work of David Abram. Uh, I'm in touch with him. And, and then he said that, um, that direct pre reflexive perception is inherently synesthetic, participatory and animistic, disclosing the things and elements that surround us not as inner objects, but as expressive subjects, entities, powers, potencies. So, Animism is not at all a religion or a philosophy. Animism is based on direct multisensorial experience with the natural world. And I think that this is very important because I think most people think of animism. Well, it was Edward Tyler who, who said that this was the religion of primitive people. He was a, a, a social Darwinist. And, 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 and since then, 
uh, animism got a very bad uh, reputation. But animism, in fact, is 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 the opposite. It is the the the, the direct contact with the living thing, and I think that I will come back to this later. This is what we need now, urgently, is to get get back to this intersubjective relationship. Because Western literature, especially philosophy, uh, its ties to the sensory world and found itself floating in a self-referential disembodied world of pure abstraction. In a way, philosophy is to a great extent, it's just people talking to each other, you know, quoting this other, you know, <laughs> it's Kant and Heidelberg and, 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 you know, and, and Jasper and this and that, but they, in a way, philosophy lost the contact with what is out there. It is self-referential to a great extent. So because, you know, so we, we, the, the, the thing with animism is, is you know, in the normal way of, of, of seeing, you have a subject and you have an object, but in animism, you have this interpretation, identity, you know, of, of the subject and, and, the, and the object. You have, in fact, two subjects. It's intersubjective. And we will see that the, the most um, um, uh, radical epistemology really is the transformation. The best way to know how a Jaguar is, is to become a Jaguar. Then you know better than, you know, what is a Jaguar, you know? So um, I've been very interested in the, the minds of, of, of the animals. These are my, my dogs, you know? And uh, I mean, how can, can I not think that they are intelligent? I know more or less, you know, what they're thinking. We relate to each other. There is no doubt that they are intelligent. There isn't a self, there is an inner self there, no doubt. And, and then you start to see, you know, go through the animal world. And of course, you know, and they use tools, they, they are reflective in a way, you know. So, so this um, uh, um, Franz de Waal wrote this beautiful book, Are We Smart Enough to Know How Smart Animals Are? Because we have been so away from the natural world, we some simply think that they are, they are, they are not uh, intelligent. And there are books after book coming out uh, about elephants, about fish, about birds, uh, um, ants, and so on. So there is a fantastic literature coming out, and even about plants, because as you probably uh, read uh, Darwin, uh, he said that it's hardly an exaggeration to say that the tip of the radical of a plant does endow with sensitivity and having the power of directing the movement of the adjoining parts act like a brain of one of the lower animals. The brain being seated within the anterior end of the body, receiving impressions from the sense organs and directing the several movements. And there is also fantastic literature coming out. Monica Galliano is one of them. She has been in, 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 with us in, in, in Wasiwaska, my organization in, in Brazil. She wrote this book, Ghost Spoke the Plant. And, Chia has been publishing many papers. You have to go to, to her website. It's very impressive. A young scientist with incredible publications. But then she there to write this book in which she says, you know, he got the ideas to do this experiment from the plants, getting in touch with the plants. She was well known by this experiment with uh, her work with the Mimosa pudica, the plant that you all know, you touch it and close it and showing that, that the plant has memory. So if you take a, a mimosa putica and drop it several, many times, there is a point in which the plant knows that there is no problem, you know, and it will not close. And, and, and then she could take the plant away for a month and repeat the experiment. And the, the, the information is there. It will not close the leaves. But if you put another kind of input, then it will close. So, so they know. There is no, no doubt you know, that uh, the, the plants also have, in, 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 you know, possess sophisticated cal calcium-based signaling and network in their cells, similar to animals' memory processes. And Florian Kirchlin, plants respond to environmental signals. They respond to touch, sight, sound, smell, and taste. They send ele electromagnetic waves and communicate through mycorrhiza networks with other plants, the wood wide web, and exchange nutrients about themselves. 
some bring in water, others for um, phosphate, nitrogen, and hydrocarbon. So on the you know under the soil, there is a lot going on. All the PTI, I don't have the, the slide here, but um, Merlin Sheldrake, the son of Rupert Shelley, just published a fantastic book called Entangled Life, showing how under in the forest everything is connected to each other. And so the uh, um, plants, um, plants are able to even feed their siblings and sometimes other species. And there is like a supermarket exchanging certain nutrients, water, this or that, you know, so it's going on. Uh, so there is a, there is really um, um, something which uh, we didn't expect at all, but it's going on simply because we cannot go under, under the soil and, and understand. Uh, I really think, uh, Cahill said, really think that we are at the cusp of a real paradigm shift and that people are going to be viewing plants very differently in the next 10 years with a much more holistic view of what plants actually are. And Daniel Chamovitz in this book, What a Plant Know, it shows, you know, shows how uh, plants have sight, smell, touch, hearing, balance, memory, they detect gravity, um, the, uh, the memory, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So, but we, most of us, we are plant. We suffer plant blindness, and plant blindness is the inability to recognize the importance in the biosphere and in human affairs. The inability to appreciate the aesthetic and unique biological features of the life forms belonging to the plant kingdom, or the misguided anthropocentric ranking of plants as inferior to animals, leading to the erroneous conclusion that they are unworthy of human consideration. Uh, a very interesting article by William Allen. And uh, Paul Summit, a good friend, he said that the mycelium is an exposed sentient membrane, sentient membrane aware and responsive to changes in its environment. Interlocking mycelium membranes form, I believe, a complex neuron-like web that acts as a fungal collective consciousness. And uh, so, Simultaneously within biology, especially in the study of animal behavior and, and, and eminently empirical discipline, there have been investigations dedicated to the study of animal, plants, and fungal intelligence that show that consciousness, understood as the dimension of subjective experience, is not a phenomenon that suddenly emerges through evolution and manifests itself in the human organism. But there is a continuity with respect to other organisms and the rest of the biosphere. Shettleworth defines cognition as the mechanism by which animals acquire, process, store, and act on information from the environment. This includes perception, learning, memory, and decision making. And this is a fantastic author uh, that you should read, Peter Godfrey Smith. He wrote this uh, uh, book, Other Minds, about the mind of, of the encep uh, encephalopods, and um, uh, which are uh, um, we di divert from each, from us uh, 500 million years ago. So this is like another, a, no, a completely different path in evolution with high intelligence. And now he published this book, Metazoa, Animal Life and the Birth of the Mind, going down into microorganisms. And uh, uh, this, uh, the, the, this paper, um, um, Pamela Lyon said, in the hope of a stimulating interest among microbiologists in this area, this review brings together contemporary evidence for cognition in eubacteria in core areas of cognitive research. Sensory is um, signal transduction, balance, communication, sensory motor coordination, memory, learning, anticipation, and decision making in common and changing circumstances. So we have intelligence all the way down, you know? <laughs> and that is what the, 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 the indigenous people say. In, you know, nature is intelligent. Everything is intelligent. And Jeremy Narvi said that in my view, the perspective of science and indigenous knowledge could be both true at the same time and could even be combined to produce a deeper understanding of the living world. Animists had long claimed that we have kinship with other species. Now molecular biology showed that human kinship with other living species was not a metaphor. We are all made of cells, of prote proteins and DNA, and in fact, we share many identical DNA sequences with flies, bacteria, bananas, and so on. Okay, now I go into transformation, which I call it the radical epistemology. Uh, there is a lot of literature about jaguar transformation, uh, Raisel Lomatov, 
uh, Rebecca Stone shows the iconography of Central and South America is full of these images of, uh, of uh, Jaguar transformation. Um, uh, Fernando Payaguaje said that, um, <clears throat> that uh, in his book, El Bebador de Yajé, he said, formerly the Sequoia group lived by the mouth of the Aguarico in front of the Napo River. At the time, there were no mestizos. My family already lived a, a group with great curacas, killers, with new animals. My family drank a lot of yajé. One day, the family healer observed that his daughter was preparing a necklace with wild coconuts. He said, wait, don't do that. I'm going to get you some good seeds because those are useless. She went to bath then took her yoko sitting on the pambil bench and began to transform into a wangana, which is a, a tape, uh, the danta. She too, uh, or, or, is a, or is a wild, uh, wild, wild, wild pig. She too mimics scroll. At the moment she had in her hand a bunch of coconuts that she handed to her daughter. As there were more relatives there, she also distributed five seeds to those closest to them and three to those who were far away. He gave her daughter enough to make her necklace. These are seeds unknown to the people in London and the Wanganas get them. So he had to transform himself. So these people are incorporating knowledge from the animal, the animals. And so in a, in a way, shamanism is about getting a knowledge, sometimes even the properties of, um, of uh, animals uh, into, the, into the being, into the human beings. I remember an ayahuasquero who was, uh, um, uh, treating a child who had problems in the legs, very weak legs. He was then uh, calling different animals, uh, armadillos that had very strong legs so that this property of the armadillo will go into the child. Or um, uh, uh, it was a case of a woman who was having difficulties to give birth. He will be a, a, a summoning a, a fish or very slippery uh, plants so that these properties will go into the, into the woman should, should facilitating the birth of the child. So the, the idea of transformation, you find it everywhere from the very earliest uh, evidence. In, in, this is from Caral, 2700 BC, where you already have the, the, the jaguar, uh, the, the therianthropes, you know, uh, human uh, jaguar. You find it everywhere. This is from Colombia. Um, in where you have the man bird, um, uh, uh, the jaguar again uh, in San Agustin with uh, somebody, uh, a shaman who is using coca. Um, in the Chavin culture, you have the jaguar associated with the San Pedro cactus. And um, this is from Central America, uh, the, the shaman associated with a certain fish and so on. So you have this all over, it's all over South America, uh, 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 the Americas. And here is a little story uh, about uh, becoming a, an animal. You, you, a shaman becomes a, a, an animal, but he has to be able to get back to his human. Otherwise, he will be crazy. So one of the illnesses is that you become something else and then you're not able to come back. So this is the story uh, from the Kayapo narrative, two brothers, Bakako and Takak Yerti, hunt a tapir, but where, when preparing in the blood of the animal, uh, uh, preparing it, the blood of the animal is fresh, the second of them. The next day, thinking that he is a tapir, Takak Yerti complains to the men why they want to kill him. They think that he had lost his mind. Bakako takes his brother to his house, but he started beating everyone. He went to the jungle and did not return. They searched for them without success for many days. And in the end, they got tired and returned. Then Bakako urged them once more to look for him in various places until they found the trail of a large tapir. They followed him and suddenly they heard his voice very loud, but lower they heard a human voice until they reached the place where the tapir celebrated the festival. There the animals danced in honor of Takabierti. They returned to the village, but the next day, Bakako, together with a party of men with bows and arrows, went to look for him. With them was a woman who carried the plants by, with which tapir diseases, diseases cure. They hear again the voice of the tapir. They find Takak Bierti already with his head transformed into a death of a tapir, copulating with a female, while the other ta tapirs dance for him. 
So here we have a case in a, a narration in which somebody um, changed into an animal, but he is not able to get back. He needs some help from the outside. Bakago gets in the way, the animals scatter and tightly grabs his brother who was begging him to let him go with his tapir wife. The men kill many animals, they take Tarak Berti away and the woman treats him with plants until she removes the tapir skin, then returns to being human. Later, Taka Gviati teaches the others the tapir dance. Very often in the Amazon, they have this idea that, uh, that uh, the uh, shaman and the animals, they can change skin. And uh, so, and uh, in the Ayahuasca Reader, the, we published with Stephen White, we have two cases uh, from Sol Barbira Friedman, who is an anthropologist, for an anthropologist, he writes how she became, he transformed into a jaguar, feeling like a jaguar, smelling like a jaguar. And Dennis McKenna, I was with him, took a, a ayahuasca with a, a, a duty V, and then he became a water molecule. And he was able to see the whole process of photosynthesis from within, and he described it fantastically. So, but the idea of therianthro transformation, you find it, you know, from uh, Europe 32,000 years ago, you find it, you know, um, in the Pyrenees 15,000 years ago in South Africa, you find the same idea, you find it everywhere. So uh, the, what the Shama does is, is um, um, change from being an object to a subject. So animism implies an intimate knowledge of the natural world, therefore graded understanding of living processes. Okay, um, I think that I'm going to uh, skip this because I think that I'm uh, going a little bit too with time, but I wanted to finish with uh, the Anthropocene, which has been, um, I've been thinking about this a lot. We all know uh, the sixth extinction, uh, uh, the, the changes in climatic changes, all this what is happening today and how we are going to remedy. And I was a couple of years ago in Museo do Amanhã in Rio de Janeiro, where there was a fantastic exhibition about the Anthropocene. Anthropocene, oh, it's in Spanish. As you know, is uh, is uh, um, the the evidence that the changes, geological, hydrological, biospheric changes in the terrestrial systems, which are anthropogenic, are our our fault. And now the the the, the question is. What is the history of the Anthropocene? In, the, in this museum, um, they put the beginning of the Anthropocene in, in the 1950s. There are some who wanted to put it in 1945. In order to, uh, to name a new uh, epoch, you have to have um, uh, geological evidence. And of course, the atomic bomb, you will find evidence of the radioactive material all over the world because it, it, you know, it goes in the atmosphere and you have traces of that everywhere, but many people um, put the beginning of, uh, of the Anthropocene in the 1950s, which they call it the, the great as acceleration. And for me being born in 1947, it is horrendous to think that I am, I am, I mean, I am the Anthropocene. I have been going through the whole, you know, I have seen uh, when I was in Florencia, uh, I was writing with uh, ink and, 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 and pen and, and uh, with candlelights, and now I have a computer. So I have gone, I remember when I first got my first ball pen, which was so precious, you know, it was very expensive. My father gave it to me, uh, uh, something very important. Uh, no, so I have seen all the changes and, and, and we know that the Anthropocene is the, 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 uh, the, uh, the increase of, everything, forest loss, terrestrial biosphere degradation, carbon dioxide, fertilizers, et cetera, et cetera. So, so and, uh, but now I found this, this, uh, this book, uh, I mean here, The Human Planet, How We Created the Anthropocene, which was suddenly like light because um, these authors put the beginning of the Anthropocene, not in 1950, but in 1610. What happened in 1610? There was no earthquake. There was no uh, huge uh, drought. It was, and, and, and they could see this in the, in the Antarctica when they take these ice cores, 
uh, and the, they are able to see how much uh, carbon dioxide was uh, uh, in, uh, in any period. And they found in 1610, it was a decrease, sudden decrease of carbon dioxide and a little drop in the temperature. So what happened there? They say this is the consequence of the, the invasion of the Americas, the death of 95 to 98% of the Amerindian population, which was mostly horticulturalists. Most of, uh, if you see a map of, of the, Ameri the pre-Columbian America, most of it, a great deal was cultivation. When these people die, this field, which were fantastic soil because they were, they, were, they were not using monoculture, they were polyculture always, mixing the different plants in, in Mexico and North America, you have the three, uh, the, the three Marys, you know, beans and corn and kala and squash together. And this is the way that uh, uh, Amerindian agriculture was always, you know, in combination with other plants. The monoculture came with the Eurasia. And so when the Indians disappear, the forest came back. So when French and the English um, colonies went to North America, they thought that the, 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 they were looking at a primordial forest, but it was not. It was a forest that came after the death of the Amerindians. And, and the same thing in, in, you know, with the Amazon. Now we know that uh, the Amazon is to a great extent anthropogenic forest. It has been, you know, the Indians have been moving plants species from one place to the other. The diversity of the Amazon is to a great extent the job, the work of the Amerindians. So, so, um, so this gives another perspective because then we have like the clash between animism, the Amerindian cosmology is mostly uh, is, um, uh, animism and then you have an alien culture coming which is monotheistic uh, is, is monoculture uh, um, it is platonic in a way you know the pure ideas which continues to today the pure chemicals the pure everything you know uh, the, the 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 apples and the bananas have to be this size because this is this is definition of an apple you know etc you know i mean it's it, so it's a clash of two ways of seeing the world completely different. And we have somehow to recuperate animism somehow. So 1492 was really the biggest revolution. We are living the consequence of 1492 because in 1492, Europe was just a poor a, a peninsula, a poor peninsula compared to the riches of Eurasia. The Europeans were, dreaming of the riches of the Orient, because Damascus and, you know, and, and, and Alexandria and, and Baghdad, and, and China, they were the, the, they were, there was civilization there. In fact, you know, they, they invented the, the powder and the paper and, you know, so on. So, but it, it was the Europeans uh, conquer America, the, the population was destroyed, the, 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 the um, all the resources of the Amerindians. And it's, this is what made Europe, you know, powerful. Uh, this is, the, so, the, and, 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 and as we know, Euro-America, um, uh, what we are uh, experiences now is the consequence of that. From the point of view of biology, we, we know what the, uh, it's called the, the biological uh, uh, invasion or biological, uh, I don't remember, is the uh, uh, imperialism. Um, in which the animals, the domestic, especially domesticated animals from Eurasia go into the Americas and now they are taking, like in, in the case of Florencia and Caquetá, you know, cattle, you know, are taking over. There are 1.3 million um, uh, cows in, 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 in El Caquetá and we have lost the forest. So I will finish with this. Indigenous people have philosophies which connect humans to the environment and to each other which generate principles of living a life which is sustainable, respectable, and possible. So we have somehow, we have to go back, you know, uh, 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 we have to back to some kind of animism because it is this separation from nature which is causing the, the biggest problems 
in, in our society, depression, uh, 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 it's to a great extent the, the separation from uh, the other um, non-human persons that live on, on this planet with us. Everything is connected. Okay. <laughs> I, don't, well, I don't know if we have, we have time for questions or whatever. Well, thank you very much, uh, Luis Eduardo, for your very, very interesting talk. Uh, I think you brought a very different perspective uh, to opera. Um, and I'm very, very glad that you that you're here with us. Uh, I would like to open up the floor for questions uh, from the audience. Um, um, and maybe Marco and Rian as well. Uh, you're very welcome to, to ask questions. Um, but while the audience uh, thinks, I would like to start. Um, Luis, you brought up a perspective that, if I understand correctly, is uh, arguing that ayahuasca might be a sentient sort of being, that the knowledge that uh, indigenous people are reporting um, is not just the alteration of consciousness and the knowledge that stems from altering uh, people's consciousness, but it might be also a dialogue between a human mind and a plant mind. Um, am I correct? Is this your argument? Uh, yes, I think so. But only that we have to think of plants not as individuals again, you know, because we cannot make the same mistake. You know, a, a plant mind is not a tree or a plant. A plant mind means all these connections. You know, once we are aware that no plant is in isolation, so you are you are in fact in touch through the ayahuasca or many other plants. You are in, in touch with the plant world, but not only the plant world, because then you have the microorganisms and all that. So, you know, so I think that what we are, we are in touch, let's say, let's put it this way, the Gaia mind, mind you know, the, 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 the mind of nature. Uh, we cannot think of, it will be a mistake to think that, ah, okay, I'm in touch with this particular plant. I think that the plant is much more than that. You know, it is all the, and besides the, the in plant, in Pablo's paintings, you can see that the one tree is, is populated by many different spirits. You know, it's, it's not one. Uh, we have the, the made the mistake sometimes when thinking of animism, uh, putting the Korean idea of the soul into the plant, you know. Uh, you know, individual soul here, an individual soul there. It is not, they are collective. Um, and in fact, uh, they have this idea of the master of animals, the master of the garden, the master of the lake, and so on. So you have the master of a place, you know, is the mind of the place, the mind of the beach, the mind of, of a mountain, etc. you know. So it's much bro broader than that. So probably what we are is it facilitates the touch with this other mind, big mind that is out there. That is my understanding. Thank you very much. I think this is uh, a very interesting answer to the problem of consciousness. That's like, uh, yeah, like, like an ongoing philosophical discussion of what is consciousness and if consciousness is only human. Uh, I think in, indigenous people have their own answer that it's that everything everything has a mind and you can communicate with it through the right means. Yeah, I mean, the, the, the animistic view and the, and the view of many of these um, um, biologists, uh, let's call it uh, um, evolutionary, evolutionary ecologists, is very similar. The only difference, the big difference is communication. That is the thing, you know, because the biologists are also uh, recognizing intelligence, you know, down to, to microorganisms, to bacteria, you know, it, it goes all the way. But 
what we have not come is to the possibility of this intersubjective connection. This is what is, you know, so they are very similar, but not, not the possibility of communication. That is the key. Thank you very much, Luis Eduardo. I would like to open the floor for our audience to ask questions. Um, yeah, so again, thank you uh, for me as well, Luis Eduardo, for, for this talk. I, th I, I thought there were a lot of interesting points that I agreed with, um, you know, especially the idea that a lot in Western culture we were a bit uh, we have lost a bit of connection, you know, uh, the sense of, I like the, the, you had a slide where you were talking about philosophy, but it kind of applies to, you know, most of like Western culture uh, in saying that it's a lot of, uh, it, it's very verbal, you know, kind of, you know, uh, rational, logic-based culture. And so we're kind of missing other aspects uh, that are important for human life. Um, so, but I was one, you know, this, this, Whole, you know, the, this whole, uh, as someone is saying in the chat, um, this whole talking about, um, you know, putting minds and, and sentience into uh, plants and and in, in things that are, you know, quote unquote, like inanimate. I, I, I wonder if, it, if there's a danger there, uh, you know, if we need to put a, you know, something like a brain into like plants to make them valuable. Uh, you know, I'm not sure that's, you know, I would like, you know, I don't think that's even, you know, I, I think just the life and the, the connection that we share with this, uh, you know, with this other being, you know, it, it could be, it should, maybe it could be enough, you know, for to, to uh, you know, to um, point out their importance and how we really depend, you know, on these other organisms, because I'm a bit afraid that if we, you know, if we try too hard to like argue that this, that there's a brain, you know, in, in, in or there's something that does similar to the brain, no, okay. Yeah, go ahead. But, <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Because that is the problem, you know, consciousness yeah. and the brain, you know. But why the brain, you know? <laughs> you know, Darwin said, you know, that, that the the tip of the radicals are like little brains, you know. But but if you see, you have to read, you know. I really uh, uh, urge you to read uh, Merlin Sheldrake's um, uh, Entangled Life, because it's amazing, you know. It, once you get into the the mushroom, you know, the mycelium, because mushroom is the fruit, but mycelium is what is, you know, the organism. It's just amazing how how they, you know, they take make decisions. And once you get there, the whole the what if one part of the mushroom or the mycelium is learning, it goes to the whole organism. They are highly intelligent, highly intelligent, and they can live forever. You know, <laughs> they, they because they, you know. Uh, so, so they they you cut it apart and, and they would just grow and, and 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 the information is never lost because the information is everywhere at the same right. time. Right. No, there, I mean, there's, so, yeah. sorry, sorry. No, I, I understand. Yeah, there is no, you know, that's undeniable that you know, definitely, like the my them and other and and plants have forms of intelligence. But you know, I'm a bit maybe I'm, maybe I'm just a bit skeptical. I mean, I understand it from an experiential perspective. But I still struggle with it from a more, you know, if you're trying to be scientific about it, uh, you, you, you know, then the idea that you would be able to like communicate with these other intelligence or somehow understand what they, what they, uh, you know, what their whole, you know, experience is, you know, it seems very, you know, it seems like a human, it seems like a projection of that we would do, you know, like I can understand taking mushrooms and thinking that I, I know like how the mushroom feels, you know, or like how it's trying to like communicate to me. But then I, when I come back, you know, and that's how it really feels, you know, but then when I come back, I'm more, you know, with that me, like kind of like, that's how I think that the mushroom thinks, you know, or, or uh, so, yeah. Because you, because you are still thinking about it. You are conceptualizing this, you know, but what these people do, it is direct experience. That is what you know strikes me with these biologists working with fish or birds or or uh, snakes or whatever you know because they have this direct experience and the only way to recognize intelligence in nature is by having the you know the direct uh, 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 the direct relationship with nature right. and you don't find that in books you find it going to the forest 
spending time there and perhaps not using the intellect, the concept, yes. you know, the chatting, no, I'm sorry. but I, just the multi-sensual way of learning. I agree with you. And I, that's what I was trying to say. Like I, I, I have, you know, I understand it from my own experience point of view, but I have a hard time reconciling it, you know, reconciling what you experience uh, with what, you know, with the, with the, with the thinking, you know, as you were saying. So I'm, it's, it's hard to like uh, something that you experience and you, you know, you understand it experientially, maybe it's too complicated to be captured, you know, by the, the, the kind of rational thinking. Is that how you feel? Is that? Yeah, but the thing is that the plants are not rational. <laughs> it is not the, the same kind of intelligence. It's completely different kind of intelligence, you know? And that, that is the problem, you know, because we, we have this tendency to think that if it is something intelligent, it has to be like us in a way. You know, somehow, you know, but but no, I mean, there is this famous uh, paper by Thomas um, Nagel. What is it like to be a bat? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's, you know, we have no idea. I mean, right. it is difficult for us even to think what other people think, you know, right. to put ourselves in the place of somebody else. In our culture, it is so difficult. There's one of the problems of, of racism and, and discrimination. It, it, somehow the Western think somehow, you know, I mean, even I'm in Finland, and unfortunately, I read a, a paper on yeah, the 40% of the Finns think that black people are inferior, you know, that have less intelligence than us, because we cannot put ourselves into the minds of even other, other races or other people within the humans even less, of course, animals, and even more le less plants and, and microorganisms and so on. It's a completely different way of thinking. And I think that once we, we accept the possibility, but not the scientific possibility, because then you are again uh, <laughs> working with, with you know, the concepts and, and you know, the separation of object and, and subject, uh, then everything changes. Uh, right. Not long time ago, sorry. No, 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 that's where I am as well because I accept that possibility. But it, it, then, as you said, maybe from it's not possible to accept it from a scientific, um, you know, as you said, from an experiential point of view, I can accept it, I can understand it. But then, from a right, right, logical point of view, is is. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Do we have any more questions? Sorry, I didn't want to like take too much. Yes. So do we have any more questions? Very, very in interesting discussion. Very, very, very interesting discussion. But uh, Mika raised their hand up a few minutes ago. So Mika, go ahead. Uh, yes, can you hear me? Yes. Um, I actually have a, a question for, for you, uh, uh, Mr. Luna. Um, it's quite a personal question for me, actually. Like I recently started my psychology uh, bachelor program and I have a huge, um, huge uh, interest in psychedelics and in consciousness. And I know that that's where I want to go. And now I'm doing my studies uh, in psychology. I, I'm not really being uh, like uh, inspired by it yet. Do you maybe have any, any um, things that you would recommend that I could do with my uh, with my interest, with my with my passion for the subject of psychedelics and consciousness research, uh, that would fit for me. Yeah. Well, I mean, I, I would recommend you what I have been doing is just try to to broaden, you know, broaden my interest beyond the human. You know, uh, there is some fantastic literature about the mind, the psychology, the psychology of animals, the psychology of plants, the psychology of, of microorganisms even, you know? So I think that, that psychologists need to broaden this perspective. Otherwise, it is a kind of um, uh, narcissistic in a way. Yeah. You know, we're always thinking about the human. Yeah? In fact, uh, I have uh, some, some uh, objections to this movement of uh, using psychedelics in 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 uh, you know when you have um, a, a, a person here who doesn't take the blue and you have somebody lying in a sofa with he headphones and the music it is one to one this is very narcissistic you know all this is this should be collective because what we need is the 
you know, the, the, the collective mind in a way. So, yeah. so I, I would recommend you to broaden uh, uh, less Freud, more young yeah. <laughs> and more you know and 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 then more more you know mind plans and all these you know because you understand even the human mind in a different way it gives us give us another perspective you know that's my advice that's what i'm trying to do i'm continue educating yeah. myself about this can i ask a follow-up question about that like um how how could i uh, because I, I agree with what you say, and the, the psychology stream doesn't really inspire me that much because I think it is too uh, narcissistic and human-centered in that way. And I have, with my personal experience with psychedelics, I've experienced things to indeed be far beyond just our human psyche. Right, um, right. So how, how, could, how could I take this passion of mine to a more professional level to actually uh, help maybe perform research in this subject or uh, do work that is meaningful in this field? Yeah, well, I, I know that this is beginning to open up. I, I'm, I'm uh, in touch with a group of in Exeter University uh, in, in England. Uh, there is a, a little group, uh, um, the, the head of this is Christine Hill. Uh, I don't remember now, it's a German. German uh, professor who is uh, working on the on the philosophy of psychedelics, and uh, it's absolutely fascinating. It's the first time that, that there is a university uh, who has a group thinking about these things, you know, seriously, you know. And uh, I don't know if if perhaps try to look in Exeter University and psychedelics. Perhaps you will find some information there and get in touch with the people there. Uh, very very interesting and well in england i mean you have uh, on one side you have the, the the imperial college doing neurophysiology and uh, very interesting people there but on the other hand you have this this group of philosophers and um, also thinking ab ab about about the psychedelics i think that they has to this, this is coming um, i mean for me i have been in this field you know i started in took Yahe the first time in 1971 uh, you know, for years and years, I was completely uh, marginalized. I mean, and like, and people my age, you know, what kind of job can you get, you know, when you're interested in drugs, you know, impossible. But now this open it up, there are possibilities. It's a question of, of finding the people, getting educated, reading a lot and thinking a lot. And I think that there is a field to come, especially now that there is, a, they're talking about the psychedelics, like billion dollars, business and all that and i'm in touch with them, some of these people but i'm a skeptical you know microdosing um, and changing the molecules so that you can patent them then then you can i mean all this is again the same old idea you know we we need more shamans or people who are in, you know learning about these things in a completely different way than the business model the typical business model which is platonistic and, and the, again the pure idea, the pure compound, uh, so that you can patent, uh, you can make money out of it. You know, so. Yeah, thank you. That, that, I am really happy with the reference you you gave me, and I'll certainly look into that. Thank you for the lecture. Okay, good, good, good. Thank you very much, Mika, for that uh, question. Uh, I would like to know if whether George or Maria uh, want to interact with Luis and ask him questions. Mm, otherwise, if I may, oh, <laughs> right, another ahead. question. Please. Relating to the beginning of your lecture, because um, I, I always um, actually uh, before thought that Yage was just a synonym for ayahuasca, but I mean, now it's saying is that it's actually two different plants from, or two different mixtures, kind of both uh, containing Banasuri of Siskati, but then other plants that are also used by distinct uh, indigenous groups. Um, but yes, and this is only two, but there are many, many others, you know. Yeah, because there I are many others, you know. Because I understood Yage as a synonym of ayahuasca, and then ayahuasca, of oh. course, being then plant mixture, which includes Banisolia scapi usually, and usually also psychotherapy aphidesis, but then it can contain a lot of other mixtures as well, or that's how I understood it. But I yes. thought your reference to, um, to ambiwaska, or using the catch word for poison in it, quite interesting. 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. He's yes. saying it more. Well, I, I was surprised myself because when uh, when I visited Apollinar back in 1979, I was with him, and, and in even 71, he, he told Yahe, but now I'm in touch with Waira Yakana Mihoy, and, mm. uh, and they call it now Ambiwaska. They said, or Yahe, but they, they, they prefer to use the term Ambiwaska, which I was surprised because Ambi or Ampi is, is a poison in, in Quechua, you know? But but of course it doesn't mean that it's a, a poison, you know. That the, the I don't know I don't know why why they are using this name. And in fact, I should call Waira and ask him why are you using this? You know, <laughs> I never heard that uh, you know years back. Okay, but it doesn't have anything to do with negative uh, association. No, no, with no, no, specific form not of at all. So just no, no, the word not at all. Not at all. Ah, interesting. Yes, exactly. And uh, but, but the way the way I was. Uh, a couple of years ago, I was talking to a, a Tucano woman who was telling me that they have like something like six different uh, um, vines and many other admixture plants. They have similar, you know. And, and in fact, uh, well, Rachel Domatov already um, uh, wrote about this. Uh, the, the indigenous taxonomy is huge because mm -hmm. they may have different names even from the same plant, but in different, in different parts of the plant. So that there is a certain yahe, which is, uh, they have a certain name, I don't remember the name, from the lower part of the vine and another one for the, the upper part, mm -hmm. depends also where they grow. They also they have a taxonomy when it is collected, uh, whether it's about to flower or not. So, because they, it is a living organism, so they have a tremendous knowledge, taxonomy, you know, a, a much better taxonomy than we have because our taxonomy mostly is, is based on the morphology. Mm. But the taxonomy is based on the effects, you know? And so they know, uh -huh, this is this one, that one, you know, this, and, and even in, in, in Iquitos, they have, this can be Trueno Ayahuasca because it's more auditive or Cielo Ayahuasca because you have visions of, or, or jaguar ayahuasca and so on, et cetera, you know? So, so the, ta the taxonomy is much richer, yeah. Mm. So again, what I was saying, the, the plan platonistic idea, okay, it is this, you know, even the, the, the idea among biologists of um, species, it is, it is uh, controversial, you know? It is mm. not so clear, you know, what a species is, you know? So it, all this is very mercurial. That's very well, thank you, Rian. Uh, thank you very much, Luis. I think uh, we can close for now the session. Um, thank you for coming, for joining us, and for opening our Ayahuasca Month with this wonderful anthropological perspective. Thank you, Luis. Okay, Paloma. Thank you very much. Glad. Thank you. Thank you to all of you. Mm -hmm.